everyone. I'm sure there's a bunch of you out there. I can only see myself and my screen. So welcome to creating a positive classroom for optimal learning. And I'm just gonna start off giving you a little bit of information about myself. Uh, my name's Sam Williams. I've been teaching for 20 some years now in lots of different roles, elementary mostly, uh, pre-K through fifth grade. And I've been a literacy coach, a district chain trainer, and an author. You can see a couple of my books there on the slide. It's my turn and I'm the boss, which a couple of you looks like will walk away with um, one of those things. You'll also notice that I'm a Disney fan and um, I like to go to uh, Disneyland out in California, even though I live a little north of Orlando. Disneyland's my favorite park. And two years ago for my 50th birthday, I went to Disney Paris. And that was one of my favorite trips that I went on with my best friend, Michelle. So let's get started. Um, today, what we're gonna be talking about is really the positive classroom. And what I want to do is start us off with a conversation about connection. And as you see here, you know, why do we need connections? So building connections, it really goes a long way um, beyond that moment of connection. It's an experience that becomes part of the child. It, it builds that foundation for them. So when you build that ground through foundation, the ground stays there even when you're not there. So we know that connections are just a really important part of our education experience for our kids. And obviously for those of you that are parents, it's an important part of bringing up your child. So connections, what do they really mean? Connections make a child feel like they're not alone, that they're safe. It gives the child a sense of importance and it increases their self-esteem and it becomes internalized and gives a child a sense of self-confidence. We know that these are all really important tools for each one of our kids to have. So this to me is one of the main focuses that we should have in school today is building that connection first. The academics will come with that, but we have to be able to reach them. We've gotta make sure that our kids feel like they're safe. We make sure that they feel important in our classroom. This lifts up their self-esteem and then really builds that self-confidence so they're ready for all of the learning that we're going to do in the classroom. All right, so what is that difference between a connected classroom and a disconnected classroom? And here's kind of what I was thinking about this. So healthy connections promote problem solving and thriving. So when we have a really strong connection in the classroom with our students and something comes up that's a problem, we have the opportunity to be able to build on that because our students feel connected to us as teachers and connected to their peers. So again, that really promotes that problem solving atmosphere in the classroom. So they can continue to build on that and learn from any kind of problem that comes up. And truly is that last word, so thrive. So that unhealthy connection, when we have that in the classroom, really promotes defensive survival skills in that effort to feel safe. We've probably all seen this in our classroom, those kids that just get defensive on everything and what they're really seeking is that feeling of am I loved am I safe and I know that this is not always the easiest thing to do in the classroom so we're going to talk about a lot of these um, a lot of tools that we can use to build that up so I want to take you through my day in my classroom and what that looks like so I've, I have this quote here either you run the day or the day runs you and I really believe that's true for teachers. We have to be the ones that are in control of what's going on in the classroom. And that doesn't mean that you have to be a tyrant in the classroom. It just means you have to know what's happening and how to control that issue. So here's a picture in the center here of my class this year. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, I teach second grade and um, I'm teaching a little north of Orlando, Florida. So these are some of my kiddos right here in the center. And around this picture, you'll see I have a few different things that kind of tell how much or what the values are in my class. So first of all, right in the center there, you see love. I tell my kids I love them every day. And I think they need to hear that from all of us. I think that's really important. 
And now even when we're doing virtual classrooms, distance learning, I think it's just as important for our kids to hear from us that we love them, that we're still here for them, and that there are people that care for them. You'll notice in the top left corner there, powerful learning. With a lot of these things, one of the most important things that we do as educators is of course our academics, right? So we need to make sure that we're addressing all of the standards that we need to hit. But all of these other items around here need to be there and need to be present for us to make that happen. So the little puzzle piece is my connection piece. This is where we all fit together as a school family or as a class family. So that's our puzzle coming together. You'll see I love my class, my little button there, and respect. I have respect for all of the students in my class. They come to me with all kinds of different backgrounds. Um, I've taught in lots of different schools in the inner city. I've taught in Detroit, in Baltimore City schools, over in Tampa. And so I've seen all kinds of different learning that's going on, all different kinds of experiences that kids come to us with. And so I think all of these things are important for us to understand and to respect where our kids come from. So as they start, I want them to make sure that they understand, I get it, I know who you are, and I'm listening to you, and I'm trying to build a community of powerful learning going on. And I want them to feel that, that sense of safety and that feeling of love in the classroom. So for me, my classroom, about, oh gosh, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago, um, I had the privilege of going to a conference um, presented by Dr. Becky Bailey on conscious discipline and literally changed my life as a teacher. So right off the bat, I want to give this disclosure to everyone. A lot of what you're going to hear today is based on Dr. Bailey's work. ConsciousDiscipline.com, there's the book right on this. If you haven't read it, if you don't have it, you need to get it. This is the one thing that I can say about anything we're gonna talk about today. This is the book for you. And here's another little commercial for that. And then what's wonderful about this book, you'll wanna buy it directly from ConsciousDiscipline.com to get the latest edition of this. But the next thing that's so important about it is that when you buy the book, you have access to an amazing book portal that Dr. Bailey has created on her website. So for every chapter, as you're reading along, you can follow through in this book portal and you'll see videos of each one of the chapters, like really showing you the skills in action. So it's just a great tool for teachers. And it's really shaped who I am as a teacher today. All right, so I'm starting off my day in my classroom and here's how I started off with a brain smart start. There are four components to this. We're gonna talk about what those four components are and show you what that looks like in my classroom. So first off, in a brain smart start, I have Unite, activities to unite. And this is doing something together as a class. First thing is we're starting off a lesson. I like to do it with song and movement. And this really builds that connection and fosters that feeling of safety because kids are getting out there and they're having a little bit of fun right together and, and they're coming together uniting. So that's the first step in Brain Smart Start. The next one, disengage stress. We can probably all use a little bit of this. Deep breathing, it gets the brain ready for learning. Don't underestimate the power of deep breathing. This is so important. I use this before we start a lesson. If I see that we're getting a little crazy in the classroom, we will stop what we're doing and we'll all take a few deep breaths. And we're gonna get into that a little bit later of what that looks like. But I want you to know disengaging stress is a big one. And of course there's other ways to, get, um, to disengage stress, but this is one of our key ways. And sorry, just so you know, I'm like, I do have my phone on here, just making sure that we're not having any um, <laughs> issues with connections or anything as we go along. So I'm keeping my phone on so that I know um, that, we, <laughs> that we have uh, everything running smoothly. And three, what I have next here is connect and activities to connect. This help means maintain attention and focus to learn. Again, as I said in the beginning, connection I think is just so critical for our students and for us. I know for me as an educator, I have to feel connected to my class. It's just part of who I am. I know that when I go in in the morning, I want, I, I'm ready for them. I'm excited for my kids to come in. 
And our last one here and our brain smart start is an activity to commit. And this teaches responsibility and mindful attention so that our kids are really there and they're engaged and have some responsibility towards our learning. So again, we're gonna kind of go through all four of these so you can see a little bit of what that looks like in the whole classroom. All right, let's get started. So first off, activities to unite. So as I said, one of the things that I like to use with that um, would be songs. And I put a couple of my favorite CDs right here for you to see. And it, you'll see the first one there says it starts in the heart. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know who Jack Hartman is. So this is a CD by Jack Hartman and Dr. Bailey. And love it. Has such great songs on it. Um, we're not going to actually listen to the songs. We have um, the sound doesn't really work well for playing music in this environment. But one of the songs that I use from this um, a lot in the classroom is My School Family. You may have heard it out there. Check out this CD for sure. It starts in the heart. And then another one of my absolute favorites, and everybody that knows me knows that this, this one gets played in my classroom a lot, and it's called Brain Boogie Boosters. And again, many of you will know The Learning Station. And so this is a CD by The Learning Station and Dr. Bailey, and it has just some really fun songs that are so interactive. Um, there's a song on here called Watch Me Listen that's like a clapping song that the kids do with a partner. It's so much fun for every grade level. I've done this with adults down to pre-K and it's fantastic. Dancing, another activity to unite is keeping that dancing going. Use Go Noodle, um, Cuckoo Kangaroo, do all, any of those that um, get the kids up and dancing and building that connection, wonderful stuff. And the next part that I use um, in activities to unite is greetings. Now, in my classroom, we do greetings um, as the kids come in in the morning. So I, on my door, I have the little choices for them to make that uh, the choice of how they would like to be greeted. And they know that it's part of their job to, um, you know, to be greeted as they come in. But this greeting is a little bit different. As we come to the carpet for our morning meeting, we, I also have the kids go out and greet each other and they'll do a little activity of greeting as they come to the carpet to um, unite. All right, so that's our activities to unite. And again, don't forget, Brain Boogie Boosters, it starts in the heart, you want those CDs. All right, so activities to disengage stress. So this image right here is from um, Conscious Discipline and these are four different breathing strategies. We're gonna do STAR a little bit later. Um, let's do together balloon right now. So I'm serious. I want you to do this with me. All right. So I want you to sit up nice and tall and you're, I assume you're probably in, I don't know, maybe some of you are laying in your bed right now. Um, but I want you to be sitting up or standing up, either one. And here's what I'd like you to do. Um, when we do deep breathing, you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. So balloon breathing goes like this. Well, here's how I do it. Hands on your head. And you're going to um, fill up your balloon by breathing in through your nose. So you're going to go just like this. And then you're going to let the air out of your balloon by doing this. And of course, the kids have lots of fun doing that one. And they beg to do balloon breathing. And we're always going to do breathing uh, three different times. So let's do that two more times. So balloon breathing, fill up your balloon. Let it out. And let's do one more. All right, let me just make sure I'm not getting any crazy messages here. Nope, looks like we're all good. All right, we're gonna talk about a few of those other ones a little bit later. So don't forget these uh, breathing strategies are activities to disengage stress. Excellent. Oh, we're gonna do one right now, actually. None the importance of belly breathing. So I love this quote by Dr. Bailey and it says, if your diaphragm is not moving, so as you're breathing in and out, your diaphragm is moving um, out and in, your prefrontal lobes, that's right here, not, are not fully engaged. If your prefrontal lobes are not fully engaged, you will be reactive instead of responsive. So let me say that again. You will be reactive instead of responsive. Our choice is simple. 
We can be a responsive star or a reactive maniac. Which one do you want? I think I will choose the responsive star. So star is smile, take a deep breath, and relax. It just feels so good to do that one. Star is a really simple one to do anytime anybody's feeling a little bit uh, crazy in the classroom. I'm sure that it has happened to you as a teacher. I can tell you there are many a times when I will literally turn my body around, turn around, smile, take a deep breath and relax. So this is one way for us to really disengage that stress. And remember teachers, this is just as important for you as it is for the students. And with that said, you might have something, um, coffee, that might also help you relieve a little stress, but this is just water. Just need to take a sip of that real quick. All right, let's go to activities to connect. You can probably already guess that activities to connect are some of my favorite. So activities to connect. There are four things that you have to have to um, four elements of connection. So these things are eye contact right here. Um, you'll notice, I mean, you can kind of see on the left-hand side, and if you're looking again for more information on this, um, Dr. Bailey's book, Conscious Discipline, is available for you to have a little more information. So I'm kind of giving you the, the overview of what I use in my classroom. So eye contact, when we're doing an activity to connect, you want your kids looking at each other, looking at you if you're doing a one-on-one -on -one with a student. Presence, that means we have to be in the moment. So you're teaching your kids to also be there in that moment. But teachers, I'm gonna tell you, this is a hard one for us sometimes because we have a million things to do, right? I mean, there's so much going on in the classroom. Maybe you've already heard that there's gonna be a fire drill any minute and you're wondering, okay, when is the alarm gonna go off? I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't do my attendance. <laughs> Whatever it is, there's a million things going on. So when we're doing something that's an activity to connect, we want to make sure that we are present in the moment. So again, smile, take a deep breath, relax, and be present in that moment with your students. And I promise you, when you do that, they will too. They will also pay attention to your cues and be present with them. The other thing for connection is touch. This is a really important one because we all need it. We do. Connection touch we need that and so we teach our kids what safe touch is this is also a behavior management tool because when you teach what safe touch is that means that you can have that conversation when touching becomes something that's not so safe hitting pushing whatever we have those conversations with students so remember we talked about touch should be something that's safe now um i know that one of the questions that um, people often ask for this what about those kids that just don't like to be touched? That's fine. You can also just have them join in the moment. And when it comes to the touch part, they can stand back, observe the whole thing, but still pay attention to the eye contact and presence in that moment. I had a student a few years ago who refused at the beginning of the year to touch, didn't want to have anything to do with it. I don't know, it was maybe about a month, a month and a half into school, all of a sudden he's like, I'm ready to um, participate in these activities. And because he kept watching how the other students were connecting with each other, he finally felt comfortable enough to join us. So it was really a great, a great moment in the classroom. And the last one for connection is for it to be something fun, a playful situation. That really helps us to kind of stay focused. When the kids know that they're gonna have a little fun, maybe they're gonna laugh through it. They're gonna think, why did I do that? That was so silly. Um, that's when they have a good time and they're really able to, to focus a bit there. So that brings us to one of our um, areas for connection. And this is, I love you rituals. One of my absolute favorite things in the classroom, I love, I love you rituals. <laughs> I know you're gonna hear me say I love lots of things, but I love you rituals really are one of my absolute favorites. And I'm going to have you watch a little video with my students here. I don't think you're gonna be able to hear them very well, um, but you'll be able to see them. And what I want you to look for as you watch my kids, I want you to look for these four elements, the eye contact, presence, touch, and playful situation. 
look at them as they're doing this I love you ritual. And then I'm going to go back and explain a little bit about what the I love you ritual actually looks like. All right. <laughs> Excellent. So short, you could see how short the um, I love you rituals really are. They don't last long. And what their purpose is, is to build that connection. So it's activities to connect. And that's why we do them in the classroom. So as you look at this, the one that the um, I love your ritual that they were doing is called Peter, Peter. You know the story, Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. Well, the words have been changed to this one. As you probably know, some nursery rhymes don't have the best message in them. Some of them are even a little violent. Um, so we changed Peter, Peter to um, Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, had a friend he loved to greet her, treated her with kind respect, and in the morning hugged her neck. And as you watched my kids doing that, you could see they were partnered up, eye contact with each other. They were ha they had touch. They were doing um, when they said had a friend you love to greet. They were crossing over, crossing the midline, doing the handshake there. They're in the moment, and it was fun. So it's again, I love you rituals. Really building that up with each other. So we're going to actually do one right now together, a little different. Um, than the one that's bringing us together there. So I want to show you the, the image here is a story hand. And story hand is one of the, um, it's an I love you ritual from a conscious discipline, a way to connect. And often it's used with a teacher to one student. And the idea here is that in your four fingers, you're saying something that you actually, that you like about the student. And then we bring them together with something that they were concerned about here and bring them together here. So what I'd like to do is um, I'd like you to do this one with me. It's called Brain Hand, and um, it was um, done by uh, my friend Kristen Abel. And um, you can check out her video um, online if you check out YouTube. Um, I love your rituals, Brain Hand. Kristen's video will come up with her class showing you how she did that. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to take your hand here and your pinky. You're going to rub your pinky here. And you're going to do something that you like to do. So I'm just going to share with you right now something I like to do. Um, I like to read. So this is um, how I'm doing. I'm massaging my pinky here. Our next one, your ring finger. Something you are good at. So, um, well, I'm good at reading. But I think I will choose something I'm good at uh, teaching. I think I'm a pretty good teacher. Um, so something I'm good at is teaching. Your middle finger, this is someone you love. And I am sending my love out to all of you right now. And so I want you to think of someone as you're doing this. I hope you are doing it with me. Um, I want you to think of someone that you love. Then as you go to your index finger, this is something you like to eat. And I have many things that are on this list. Um, and for some reason this week, I've been a little, because I'm dieting, I've been a little obsessed with pizza, like wanting um, pizza more than more than normal. Um, so something I like to eat, pizza, but Thai food's my favorite. And the last thing you're going to do is, and this one, I tell the kids when you use this with them, is that you keep this one private. This is just yours, and it's something that you might be worried about right now. So you keep this one together, and here's what you do. You're going to fold your thumb in. And then you're going to fold your other fingers over here. And it's called the brain hand because this is how we teach kids about the brain model um, uh, using their hand, showing you know, all the different parts of the brain. We're not going to go through all that right now. But here's what happens. So your worry is here, but it's covered by all of these wonderful things that you share. And so you're going to, again, massage this. And you're going to think about that worry. You have all of these things. This is something that you like to do something that you're good at, that person that loves you and that you love. So this is a way for us to get kids um, to really think about themselves and kind of hopefully lift their spirits a little bit as they do this activity. It's also, again, the story hand or the brain hand can be something that you do one-on-one -on -one with a student to um, further your connection with them. 
Okay, so activities to commit. This is um, the last one here in our Brain Smart Start. And with activities to commit, first off, I want to say as you're looking at this, this is not a behavior chart. Um, I'm sure you've seen many that look like this with the clips on the side. It's not a behavior chart. This is the daily commitments in my classroom. So the one on the left here with the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, that is what I start off the year with. And you've probably seen a lot of these type of things up on your rules or your expectations in the classroom. So you can say, I'm going to use um, watching eyes today. I'm going to use listening ears today. I'm going to use my walking feet today. I'm going to use my gentle touch today. I'm going to use my kind words today. So what happens in the morning is that my students, their clips are sitting on the table in front of this daily commitment chart. And one of their activities, and I'll show you again in a minute what that looks like, but they come in and they decide which of these daily commitments are they working on today? What's one that they're like, hmm, I am having a little bit of a hard time with using my listening ears. So maybe this is one that I need to really bring to the forefront and pay attention to today. So I'm gonna put my clip there on, um, I will use my listening ears. So that's where they clip that one. And um, the, I know that they've made that commitment. Now, why this works in the classroom? First of all, it's their commitment. They've made that. But throughout the day, if I happen to notice that Johnny, who made the commitment for I'm going to use my listening ears today, is struggling with paying attention in class and is not listening to what's going on or not listening to one of his friends, then I might be able to draw him back to the commitment chart and say, so Johnny, what was your commitment today? He was like, oh, it was, um, I'm going to use my listening ears. And this, this sounds funny, but this is what I say to him. How's that going for you? And usually they're, they're either a little like, what? You know, a little ashamed almost. And I'm like, how's it going for you? He's like, well, I guess I have been having a little bit of a hard time with that. Okay, so what can we do different to make that better for you? And, you know, we talk about how do we change that behavior for them and what's a piece that we can use for that um, in the classroom to make this easier. And then at the end of the day, I might say, you know, I think since you were had a hard time with that today, maybe tomorrow that should be your commitment, too. And we can use some of those activities that we talked about to further your commitment. So it's just a way to kind of get them in those rules that we have at the beginning of the year. This is a way to kind of introduce those and get kids to really think about them on an individual level. Okay, so the next one you'll see on the right here, um, I change about halfway um, or so through the year to this right here. These daily commitments at my school, we have a list of what we call standards. And I don't mean education standards, these are our school standards. And you'll see right here, it says, do the right thing even if no one is looking. Learn as much as you can every day. Use your time wisely. Follow and respect the rules wherever you are. Be kind in your words and in your actions. Take care of your possessions and the possessions of others. So these standards, they have to abide by all of them in our school and they're posted all over our school. But this is something that every morning they make this commitment to really use this one. And I've had a lot of kids who I, like you'll see, I mean, several kids chose do the right thing even when no one is looking. And we've had conversations about what does that mean? It means when we're out on the playground and maybe a teacher's not seeing you, it's still time to do the right thing. Use your time wisely. We all know kids who need help with that, right? I mean, they don't plan out their work, you know, in the time that they need to finish it. So these are all skills that we can help them with. Remember, when we're dealing with especially younger kids, they don't have all of these skills with them. We have to help them. So we're teaching them how to explore these and what to learn from them. Okay, so that's our um, brain smart start. And then here's what it looks like then in my classroom. So when my kids come in in the morning, again, they greet me at the door. And then on our, I have a um, projector and it's showing on the screen here. This is what they see first, good morning. And then they have their to-do list. 
greeting Mr. Williams. Put the chairs around the table. Put your backpack in the cubbies and your lunchbox in the black crates. Make your daily commitment, which we just talked about. Today is library day. Turn in your library books. Reminders. Um, maybe we had some paper that went home. If you have a form your parents gave you, um, give that to Mr. Williams. You'll see I have the date today. Today is May 20th, 2020. We will go to the library today. Morning work. You may find a comfortable place to read this morning. Now, obviously, all of you are not teaching an age of student where they can read all of this. So this is when you can use picture clues in here. You have pictures up here for what are you doing today? Maybe you have a picture of them putting their backpacks in the cubby. You have a picture of them making the daily commitment. So you have these items up here so that it leads them to start their morning off right, organized and ready, ready to go. Then as after we've all finished our um, morning work and everybody's here and we've listened to our morning show, my school has a morning show that we watch you know, um, on screen, then we're ready for our morning meeting. Before they come over to the carpet, the first thing we do, you see a list of activities, but the first thing they're gonna do from their chair, everybody stands up and I show them different yoga poses. So they may start right off with um, whatever we're choosing today. And so from their seat, they do that. The next thing you remember, breathing strategies. So pretzel breathing. Let's do this one um, quickly together here. Hands out in front of you like this. Thumbs down, cross them over, bring it in. And I'm sitting in a chair, so I'm gonna cross my feet here. Usually my kids are standing up when they do this one. Um, you can put your thumbs on your chin here. And we're gonna take a nice deep breath in through our nose. Out through our mouth. We do that two more times. Now, one thing that I look for as I teach my kids about breathing is that they're not doing this, where you see this. Kids, you know, shoulder breathing and our shoulders don't breathe. So you wanna teach them to breathe from your diaphragm as you breathe in, your stomach goes out and vice versa. So we want them to um, practice breathing. So then the next thing they do, they're still standing by their seats. They've pushed in their chairs. We've done a little breathing. And then I tell them, okay, everybody, you're going to greet friends. Today, I want you to greet at least three friends. I want you to say hello. And I want you to decide on your handshake with your friends. Move on to your next friend. So you greet three friends and then you come to the carpet. So they kind of know the routine of what they do right there. And then what I do is I have one of them read our sharing for today. It's usually a job in the classroom. Excuse me. Um, and sharing today. So we're all sitting in a circle on the carpet. What is something you do with your family every night? I like for them to share rituals that they have with their families, but every day I ask them different questions. Sometimes it's silly stuff. Sometimes it's something a little bit deeper. Um, so I ask them a sharing question and then we do an I love you ritual, which you saw them. Those were my kids that we watched the video of doing an I love you ritual. So they were doing um, Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. I love your ritual. Then I like to have them do a little activity. You'll see this one, um, 11s, where they have to get into groups of three. They put one hand behind their back. And then on the count of three, one, two, three, they have to hold up however many fingers. And they have to count all three people. And they have to equal 11. Um, and that's the and until they get 11, they keep trying. So it's just a fun way to get them, you know, a little active. And then we come, we have a seat back on the carpet. Notice we're doing a little up and down, making sure that our kids are active um, first thing in the morning. Morning message. So um, it's somebody's job in my classroom to read the morning message. So they read, you know, dear class, today is Wednesday, May 20th, 2020. We are going to learn about building connections within our school family. I feel so lucky to be a, um, part of such a loving group. Love, Mr. Boyd. Of course, normally I'm saying a few things that are going on during the day. We're visiting the library today. Um, if I know that there's gonna be a fire drill at 9.30, I might tell them that. Whatever, something else. Today's art day, so we're going to art class. Whatever that might be, we're going to, um, you know, I'll usually put that in my morning message. Then that brings us to, um, this is how I take attendance in my classroom. I use the wish well board, and this is the actual one for my classroom. It's made out of a dollar store pizza pan and um, a little heart cut out in the center. The names are on, um, honestly, just a piece of uh, white cardstock 
with a little magnet tape on the back. And um, the person who is our wish wall person, they come up and they read everybody's name. They say, Mr. William, here, Patty, here. If someone is absent, so let's say Evelyn is absent, we put we take Evelyn's name and we put her in our heart. And once we go through the whole list of all students, now I know who's here, who's not. Normally I already do by that point, but um, we put them in the heart, and then we do a little a little song here, very quick. It's just we wish you well, we wish you well all through the day today we wish you well and then we do a little heart and this is where i tell them we're going to send our energy from our heart out to them to the person that's absent today the kids love it when they're absent they want to know that we wished them all well all right so that's the wish well board one of my favorites in the Another thing that we have in the classroom, and this really helps to build community and creating that positive classroom. Everybody has job charts in their classroom, I'm sure. What I want to emphasize here is that every kid should have a job every day. Sometimes it's hard to come up with enough jobs for them. So you'll see on the right, I listed some that maybe you haven't used before, um, but maybe you have, but coming up with a job for everybody. So I have um, techie. If I have a kid in the class who's really good at um, technology, you're gonna be the one that's setting up our laptops for the day. Substitute, if someone's absent, your job to take over their job. Pencil sharpener, because I don't let them get up and sharpen their pencils, but it's gonna be someone's job to do that. Drink manager, this could be bartender or teachers, um, but not the same thing. Drink manager, this is the person who monitors when we're at the water fountain, you know, if you have them counting, you know, one, two, three, um, not for me, then that's your drink manager. Rockstar. Rockstar is the person that gets to choose the music for um, the activity that we're doing. Hand sanitizer. That one today is definitely self-explanatory. Recess manager. If we're taking out any um, soccer balls, whatever we're taking outside, anything that we're doing for recess, they take that out there. Phone attendant. Um, I will tell you, I haven't used this one in my classroom in quite a while. Um, honestly, the phone doesn't ring in my classroom very often, but um, I have had in the past where students learn how to answer the class phone. And, um, you know, that obviously depends on your school as to whether that, that works. Something else that I have in my classroom is celebration station. So it's honestly, you'll see there on the right, it's just a little drawer and it has all kinds of stuff for celebrating. And this could be I have all the stuff ready to go for birthdays, um, anything else, you know, um, Jake won the big soccer game, whatever it is. And if you're the person that's in charge of Celebration Station, you get to make a card for them, decorate their seat, um, hand them, if you have little treats that you hand out for them, that's what you do here. It's to celebrate anything that's going on in the classroom. So that is Celebration Station. And it takes that responsibility off of you to always be responsible for birthdays and all of that in the classroom. And the kids love being responsible for, for that. It's a great way to make that happen. The We Care Center, um, and this, again, mine is actually, I didn't have a picture of mine, but it's just a drawer in the classroom. Celebration stations in one drawer and the We Care Center is in um, the next drawer. And with that, it just has note cards and different pens and pencils and all kinds of stuff. And if somebody's not feeling well or someone in their family is sick, we can make cards for them. The other thing that I put in my We Care Center would be any of the um, Band-Aids or anything like that that we need. If someone gets hurt, the person who's in charge of the We Care Center is responsible for getting Band-Aids out. Yes, I know, blood and all of that. Um, so you have to you know, make sure that everybody is safe and however you're doing that. But they can be the person that hands them uh, a Band-Aid to take care of their cut. Safe place. Um, another one of my uh, go-to places in the classroom, like this is um, this is in my classroom this year, the safe place. You'll see um, right on the wall there, I have our breathing strategies. You'll see my little pillows that have the breathing strategies on there. The safe place is really meant for um, our kids to go to when they're not feeling great. This is sad, mad, however they're feeling. And you have to teach them how to use this. 
So it's not open at the beginning of the year. I have to teach them the strategies, the breathing strategies, um, whatever you're going to use in there to help them to get back to compose. So when kids are sad, they can go to the safe place, spend a few minutes in there, kind of get themselves back together. And when they have some of those tools, like they know the breathing strategies, um, I also have calming lotion in there. It's literally dollar store lotion that you put a little label on and they put a little lotion on their hands. One of the nice things about using like scented lotion, if you're allowed to in your classroom, is that as soon as you use scented lotion, um, when the kids have that on there, they're smelling it, which means that they're taking in a breath. So they're taking in a nice breath as they get there. Um, you may have a classroom that doesn't use it very often. I've had classrooms where I've had somebody in it every day. Um, it just depends on what the kid's needs are. The question that I get asked most often is, what if a kid abuses this and just goes to the safe place all the time? You have to keep that conversation going with them. If they've been in there for a little while, I'll go over and I'm like, how are you feeling? And if they're like, oh, I need to stay here for a while. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, so um, we're in the middle of math. Sometimes math is one of those reasons why kids are like, I need to go to the safe place. Um, so we're in the middle of math, so I'm gonna give you two more minutes in the safe place, and then I want you to come back and join us. So it gives them a chance to kind of be by themselves, take care of their own needs, and learn to um, some of the strategies that help them to get back to compose. So that's our safe place. All right, so how to deal with non-compliance. So I kind of added a few things in here after I looked at um, some of your questions, because I saw um, before, uh, we did the webinar. I saw some of the questions, and this was a big one. Um, what do I do with the, the kids that you know are not doing their work, are not doing what I'm asking them to do? So one of the tools that um, that I use, and again, this is from Conscious Discipline, is choices. Um, if you focus on two positive choices that achieve your desired outcome. So if you want here Stevie to clean up blocks, clean up after center time. You need him to, to, to do that, right? That's your desired outcome. Center time, your station is cleaned up. That's the desired outcome. So what can't be your choices are, are CV, you can pick up the blocks, or you can go to the office. Those are not two positive choices. Even CV, you can pick up the blocks, or you can go to your seat. The go to your seat doesn't give you your desired outcome. It now means you're cleaning up the box. So here's what this looks like, two positive choices. So Stevie's not cleaning up after center time. Here's the language that I use. Stevie, you may pick up the blocks first or the cars first, which works best for you. Now, this is where you really want to notice their behavior. If he says, I know, pick up the cars first, and he's picking up the cars, you did it. You picked up the cars. Now we can all get ready to go to lunch. So instead of saying, good job, great work, we use, you did it. You picked up the blocks and then the cars so we can all go to lunch. Now I will tell you, occasionally Stevie says, neither. I don't wanna do any of it. And this is where we have to maintain our composure. And we have to say, Stevie, you may pick up the blocks first or the cars first, which works best for you. What can happen is that we lose our cool because when we lose our cool, we're not gonna get anywhere. We've all been in that power struggle with kids, right? And it never works out. So we want, we want to maintain cool. Now, I will tell you, this whole topic could be another three hour presentation. So I'm just giving you some of the highlights here. But choice, you will find this language really works. So we're gonna look at a couple more. All right, so in this one, Karen is not doing her work. Here's what, she, here's what she may say to me. You may work at the table with your friends or you may do your work by my desk, which works best for you. Karen might think about it for a minute. She's like, I really wanna stay with my friends. Okay. Now I walk right away and then I am observing, noticing, her behavior, and I see, I'm like, Karen started her work. And so I make a point to go over there. You did it, you started your writing. That simple. Just give her the two positive choices and then 
come back and notice that behavior. You did it. You started your writing. It's a simple way to bring that together. All right, conflict resolution. <laughs> Another one that was brought up a lot in the questions. Um, what do we do? So conflict. This is really a time to teach missing social emotional skills, giving students an opportunity to learn new skills to help them properly deal with conflict. And one of those ways that I use in my classroom to help students in this area is to teach them how to utilize an assertive voice. There's lots of areas that come into play with conflict resolution, but I really, I believe this with all my heart. It really, it is kids that are missing something. They're looking for love, they're looking for attention, they don't feel safe, there's something else going on. So we're looking for a way to help them through that. So here's the language that we use from conscious discipline. It says, I don't like it when you, next time, whatever that may be. So let me give you um, an example here. I don't like it when you take my markers. Next time, ask me if you would like to borrow them. Assertive voice, it can't sound like this. That's not assertive voice. So some kids, you have to help them. And you tell them, match my voice. I don't like it when you take my markers. Next time, ask me if you would like to borrow them. There's no please or thank you in this because it's not, you're not saying, please ask me the next time. No, it's not a question. It's a statement, assertive voice. Another example, I don't like it when you push me out of the way. Next time, tap me on the shoulder and say, excuse me. Now, I know some of you might be thinking if you've never tried this before, um, you're like, how are my kids ever gonna say this? A lot of role play, a lot of practice to get to this point. I will tell you several years ago, um, I was teaching third grade and um, I taught our kids this. And one day the PE teacher comes to me and he's like, so what have you been doing in the classroom? And I'm like, well, what exactly do you mean? He goes, the kids are all solving their own issues with any game that they're playing. And he said, I hear them using these words. And so I explained to him what that was. He's like, wow, that's pretty amazing that these kids are able to work through that um, on their own. We just need to give them the tools to do it and show them what that language looks like. So here's a little bit of how this is different here. Now, I don't like it when you take my toy, give it back. And that is appropriate to say that, give it back. This is assertive voice. Aggressive would be, I don't like it when you take my toy, give it back to me now. Aggressive voice. The other kid might be like, forget you, I am not giving you that toy back. Or they might throw it, whatever it is. So assertive voice, the other kid looks at you and like, okay. And really we have to teach that other student, how do they respond to that? And it's as simple as I can do that or okay. We really make it that simple. All right, and um, also from Conscious Discipline, the time machine, if you've ever seen this, fantastic tool for teaching conflict resolution. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side, we have a student that starts on this side and then the student um, on the other side of the mat. And what happens is you'll see the same language that I just showed you, I don't like it when you, you'll notice that please is on there. I don't, I don't normally teach them please but we have them say those words as they move through this process. I'm just kind of putting this in here so that if you're interested in learning a little more, the time machine is one you will love. And why it's called the time machine is you go to both students and you're like, I see we were having a problem with pushing. Are you willing to turn back time to solve this problem? So the conflict resolution time machine, check it out. Okay, something else that I have in my classroom, friends and family board. And the kids love this. I asked all the parents at the beginning of the year, can you please send us in pictures of your family and your friends? And we make a friends and family board. And if your kids are feeling a little sad, they miss home, this is a great place for them to go. They can look at their pictures of their family. I tell you, it gets used all the time. Um, this one is an example from a school family board. So it was the teachers and all of their families that they had displayed in the school. You can also do a friends and family book, show different um, so that they can flip through. They love looking at other kids' families too. So it's a nice tool to use. Parent connection. Um, so I worked on a book several years ago with my friend, Dr. Jean, and it was called Parent Power. 
And one of the things, and you might know her song, Kiss Your Brain. Um, so this is one that she came up with, and I love this. So I'm creating little brain tickets. And at the end of the day, um, the kids come up to you and you ask them, what's one thing that you learned today? What's one thing you did today? And they tell you something about it and you hand them the brain ticket. You also train the parents to know when they go home to ask for the brain ticket. So instead of getting the usual, what did you do today? Nothing. Now they have a connection with that. They've got that ticket that they told their teacher the one thing they learned and now they're gonna be able to tell their parents. The parents have loved this. Pre-K on up, kiss your brain tickets, fantastic. Um, also connecting with parents. Um, I use right now during virtual um, learning, I'm using Class Dojo to help um, with pictures, with lessons, all of that going on in the classroom. Um, Class Dojo is a fun way to be able to share all of that information. ESGI has wonderful progress reports that you can send so easy when you're using ESGI to be able to send, print out this um, report of how they're doing in their studies and you send it right to the parents. It's right there for you, you cannot mess it up. It's, it's great. So keeping that connection going with parents. All right, so we're coming to the end here. So I'm gonna talk about um, a few of the questions that um, you guys submitted already for this that we didn't cover in uh, the session. So um, what strategies can we use in the virtual environment? Um, <laughs> yeah, the virtual environment. I know we've all been involved in this now for, um, I'm sure most of you for at least, um, I guess it's been almost two months or more than two months. So a lot of the stuff that we talked about today in the webinar can be used in that. Your morning meeting. Um, when I meet with my kids virtually in the morning, we have a regular morning meeting, just like we did in the classroom. We do all of the activities, we just do them virtually. So that's one way to do that. The I love your rituals. Again, if you wanna learn more about that, check that out on YouTube, check out Dr. Bailey's book, but um, I love your rituals. You can absolutely do those. We're missing the touch part to that, but we can, you can ask them, if you have younger kids, tell them to get their shell out and do and I love your ritual with that. So it's another way to make that connection. Breathing strategies. For sure, you can use those in your virtual um, classroom. Sorry, and I know I'm going through these quickly here. Um, what strategies can I use to work with parents? First thing I wanna say about that, and I don't mean this in any condescending way at all towards parents, but help them by teaching them. Show them some of the tools that you're using in your classroom that work for you. Have that conversation with them. Here's what works with Johnny in the classroom. Maybe you can try that at home. Um, Train your parents about I love you rituals to do at home. I will tell you the parents that know about I love you rituals, love them at home. It's a great one. And then using all of the virtual tools, ESGI, whatever you're using, uh, Class Dojo to make those connections with uh, your families. And how can we help young kids understand their feelings? Wow. Well, there's lots there and I'm looking to see everything that I wrote down here for, for this one. So. Um, first thing that I would say about feelings um, is that we talked about just a little while ago, assertive voice, which I use the words big voice when we talk to younger kids using your big voice. That is really a start to understanding our feelings and reminding our kids it is okay to feel sad or mad. As a teacher, as the adult, what's really not okay is for us to say all the time, it's going to be okay that doesn't really help them. We have to kind of give them, we need to give them some empathy. And that may look like it's really hard when you come to school and you miss your mom. It's really hard when uh, and there are some really difficult things that come up in teaching. It's really hard when you lose your family pet. And having that empathy with your kids and that um, showing them that you care and that you're listening, that's a way to, um, show them that feelings are okay. And again, just not always saying it's okay because maybe it's not right now. So we need to help them to understand that a little bit. And that's empathy. And let's see here, how do we get students to greet each other in the virtual setting? So greetings, you know, there's lots of different things that we can do for greeting. Um, so in my morning meetings with my kids right now through virtual learning, um, I have them um, doing where each we call on each kid and we're like, 
good morning, Jake, and then they say good morning to the class, and you can do virtual high five, you know, whatever you, whatever may work for you. Obviously, touch is not happening in that way, but making that part of your standard for what you're doing in every virtual lesson. We're gonna start it off with breathing, and it does take a little while to do that. I mean, I have to go through every single one of the kids and let them, and I also let them share out, how are you feeling? And tell us something about your, about your day. Um, let's see, what are strategies for dealing with kids who always want attention? I'm sure we've never had any of that. And now, this is again where you may use some of the strategies that we talked about in the webinar today. Um, choice, giving those kids who are always thinking like, you have you have a choice you may do your work here with your friends because that's what they really want or you may come sit by me or you may go over to the guided reading table and that's one way to really um, to talk about that and then i see we're almost out of time here so i've got one more for us um how do we redirect a student that is disruptive in a way that is private in the moment without having to stop class so this is a big one and this is my first suggestion for you is the safe place once you train your kids how to use the safe place when a student is feeling disruptive the very first thing you may be able to say to them is do you need to visit the safe place and they're like i do and they go and once they've learned those skills they can go there and you know really get themselves composed again and i understand this doesn't work for every situation but trust me, I've been using it now for nine years and I have seen it work wonders. So the safe place would be a good one. Um, and again, remembering that um, our disruptions in the class are a chance for us to teach something. It's a chance for us to all learn together, to have that conversation about what the appropriate um, behavior should be in class and having those moments. But that safe place is that, it's that go-to place for you. Do you need to visit the safe place? My kids all know that once they've learned it, they don't even have to ask um, where to go with that. All right, so I think we're pretty close. Yes, <laughs> Sam, great job. Everyone has some great comments, which I will send to you later. I really want you to see all the positive feedback that you're getting. But we, if you're ready, if you want to take a little drink of water, We'll do a lightning round. These are fast right. questions that I think you can answer very quickly that came from the live um, okay. webinar. Ready? Gotcha. How did you create your little animated emoji at the very beginning? <laughs> he is pretty awesome, isn't he? Um, what is it called? Oh my gosh, I can't remember the name. There's a Fiverr? I don't uh -huh. know. Uh-huh, Fiverr, yes. Fiverr. Um, I looked online for someone. This guy was in Romania, of all places, had a fantastic price. And I told him, I said, here's what I want. You'll notice he doesn't exactly look like me. My joke always when I'm out training someone is I said, I told the guy, I'm like, here's what I look like 20 years ago and 50 pounds lighter. So there you go. That's teacher Sam 20, 20 years ago, <laughs> red hair instead of gray. We should do that. We should all do that. Okay. Um, how can we get the daily commitment chart or cards? Um, so daily commitment, I literally, I made them myself. I, that was just literally typing that up and whatever commitments you wanted to, to use um, in your classroom, I printed them. I did them on cardstock, laminated each one. If you looked at the back of, it's a whole long thing. I literally just taped them all together. Um, as far as the actual, uh, the rules that come in the beginning and then the standards from my school, the rules were ones that I've used for years. You know, I'm using, listening ears, et cetera. Um, so that may be one that if you wanna copy those ones, you can go back to um, the presentation and use that. But I, I just printed it on colored, colored paper. Awesome, that's, that's great to know. Uh, can you demonstrate for us drain breathing? Ah, absolutely. Um, so drain, hands out in front of you and um, drain is where we might wanna put a little bit of our bad energy in here. So you're scrunching up your face a little bit. You're putting all that negative energy in your fists here in front of you. And then we take a deep breath in and we drain all that bad energy out and we let our hands go. Drain. Excellent, thank you. And how long do your students have their jobs? So at the beginning of the year, it lasts a little bit longer, at least a couple of weeks. But once I'm past probably the first month of school, it's one week. 
they like to change. <laughs> I've tried it longer because you know how it is as a teacher, changing jobs or whatever. You like for them to get really good, but they want to change. So I like to, um, after the first month of school, maybe if you're doing pre-K or K, it needs to be longer, but second grade for me, a couple weeks and then we're we're down to one week. Okay, good to know. And while I get ready to say who the winners are for today's webinar, can you just let us know where you got the pillows that were in your safe place? Absolutely. ConsciousDiscipline.com. You need, if you don't have that written down, as my friend Dr. Jean says, smart teachers write this down. ConsciousDiscipline.com. So you want to go visit that for sure. Get the book, buy the pillows. You're going to love it all. Excellent. Now, Sam is on Instagram. Sam, do you want to tell us how we can find you on Instagram? Sam Teacher 68. Fabulous. People want to know. They want to follow you. They love your ideas. And thank you so much for presenting all this information today. I, I had a <laughs> We're so glad to have you. And just so everyone knows, ESGI does sponsor these webinars every month, and they are free of charge. If you've tried ESGI in the past, please check out all of our new features with over 1,400 custom assessments that you can try for free. If you've never tried ESGI before, sign up for your free 60-day trial using promo code TEACHERSAM. TEACHERSAM is your promo code for tonight's webinar. Thanks again, Sam. We're so glad to learn from you today. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye.